Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular work session meeting of Tuesday, September the 24th to order it at this time. Um, the first item on our agenda for consideration is the approval of the agenda. Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The next uh, <coughs> order on the order is proclamation regarding fire prevention week. And it's in your session on page uh, one, two. The 2024 fire prevention week proclamation. Whereas the city of Cherryville is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting our city. And whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greater risk from fire. And whereas nearly half, precisely 49%, of all home fires involve cooking equipment, and whereas smoke alarms sense smoke well before you can, you can, alerting you to danger in the event of fire in which you may have as little as two minutes to escape safely, and whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, and whereas city of Cherryville residents should be sure everyone in the home understands the sounds of the alarms and knows how to respond. And whereas City of Cherryville residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas City of Cherryville residents will make sure that smoke and CO alarms meet the needs of all their family members, including those with sensory or physical <coughs> disabilities. And whereas City of Cherryville fire responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas City of Cherryville residents are responsive to public education measures are better able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2024 Fire Prevention Week theme, Smoke Alarms Make Them Work For You, effectively serves to remind us that it is paramount to learn the importance of having working smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors within the home. Therefore, I, H.L. Bean, third mayor of the city of Cherryville, do hereby proclaim October 6th through the 12th, 2024, as Fire Prevention Week throughout this state, and I urge all of the city of people of Cherryville to install test and replace their smoke alarms for fire prevention week 2024 signed by page h green certified municipal clerk and hl being mayor okay i think everyone understands that and thank you to our fire department for being proactive in putting this information out there i know janice and myself both have had <clears throat> Uh, family members that died from a fire within the home and it's really paramount as you said to make sure that everyone does have a working alarm system of some type in their home so thank you chief all you do can i ask the chief a question jason do y'all will y'all assist anyone in the house with if they have a fire alarm absolutely and they don't, know, they don't know how to change the batteries. Yes, we absolutely will. <laughs> Even not me, no, really, it's not me. <laughs> no, it's not me. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it is, but it's hard for I have several, but I can't get them to stay up on the wall. <laughs> okay. 
All right, next on our agenda is the appointment, uh, consideration of appointment to the Planning and Zoning Board. Planning and Zoning Director Richard Elam will make the comments on this. Good evening. Well, we need to replace an ETJ member. Vita Jackson has to be removed for some personal reasons, so she was taken off, so now we have an opening. And I'm asking that Mr. Scott, uh, William Scott Bean, asked to be on the board, and I'm presenting that as a recommendation tonight. He once served with me years ago for many years on the board, so he's familiar with the how planning and zoning works. And I would ask that he be approved up to June the 30th, 26, because it seems like all the other members come to you next on the 27th, so just trying to get him, trying to get these things staggered from here on out. Okay. He'll be finishing a term and going to the 26th. 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 26th, correct. Okay. But, uh, <coughs> I'd like for the council to vote on this tonight because after the council's approval, I have to go to Gaston County Commissioner's meeting to get him approved there in times of the essence. Okay. Council, what's your pleasure? I make a motion that we approve William Scott Bean. Second. As our ETJ member. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. We'll be taking care of that. Okay. Uh, item four is presentation of a PowerPoint presentation being done by uh, our marketing coordinator Steve Panton, and the, we have it, materials in our agenda here. But Steve will be leading us through this. Yep, thank you. Well, thanks uh, for this chance to talk to all of y'all. I know that uh, several of you have seen uh, these materials multiple times and uh, this has been uh, about a two-year process to get us to this point where we have something that most folks can uh, agree to. Um, this has been uh, worked again with a couple of council members, the uh, city manager, uh, the, the Main Street Board of Records has approved it. Uh, and I've also uh, uh, chatted uh, with, uh, about it with Richard. So uh, it's been it's been uh, worked pretty well. I look forward to hearing uh, your comments. Uh, talk about at the end of this what the next steps will be with a public meeting set probably somewhere in February so we got a little bit of time to still work it so uh, this is kind of where we are here with these products we uh, did the ARV uh, which you folks approved a couple of years ago that was uh, revised we're going to talk about the Central Business District building standards which is uh, the first one we'll talk about we did the murals as you may recall uh, about a year ago and then we're going to talk about the vacant buildings so again these are two separate uh, ordinances which we'll talk about and we also uh, did the sidewalk marking uh, wordage uh, a little bit ago so this hopefully will be the last time uh, I have to uh, stand here and bore you about ordinances but I think we've come a long way so this first one is the standards for buildings ground and structure in the central business district this has been something that we really needed. Uh, other municipalities have something like it. I tripped off of Kings Mountain and many others that keep referring to their building standards, but if you don't have any standards in place for the Central Business District, then you can't really hold folks accountable for keeping their buildings uh, the way they should look. So that's what this is all about. Uh, the agenda, I won't read that to you. Um, we'll uh, make a pretty short order of this. And the purpose of uh, this whole uh, presentation of, of this ordinance, rather, is to uh, help us keep the historic character of our downtown. It's, it's a jewel. We want to keep it that way. To enhance property values and to enhance the, the appeal of downtown. This is kind of like uh, an HOA. And you, you've got to be sure that all the buildings downtown uh, are, up, are kept up and that nobody is bringing down the property values of others and to prevent blight or vacancy. So that's what this is all about. It, the applicability, of course, is in the Central Business District, as you can see from that map there. Responsibilities uh, that we've identified uh, in the ordinance, and again, this is what we're looking at right now, of course, just the PowerPoint that's talking about the actual pros that's, that's uh, in those ordinances. So 
you want to take those and, and read them uh, at some point, it would probably be helpful. Uh, so the zoning administrator has the uh, responsibility for enforcement, inspections, permits, and also warnings after ratification. But he can't do all that uh, without a significant role from the downtown director. So the downtown director has to identify non-compliance with the ordinance and then talk to uh, the zoning administrator. And of course, ARB has responsibility uh, for incentive grants. And then that also the downtown director talks about tax credits for those that want to use those significant uh, dollar savings for those that are trying to rehab their building. And then of course, marketing. So once we've uh, put this in place, uh, once you've voted, what do you have as far as your in-state strictures and downtown central business district? Well, you've got the, the fire and building codes, uh, which are of course existing already. You also have the charitable zoning ordinance, which has been in place for more than 20 years. And there's a lot of great stuff in that uh, uh, zoning ordinance, but this is just on top of that that kind of fills in some of the gaps. So you'll have this, uh, this ordinance that uh, we're going to hopefully approve in February. <coughs> so let's talk about the uh, charitable zoning ordinance for just a moment, because there's an awful lot in there that we don't have to, to rehash. Uh, for new and expanding construction, it talks about screening uh, for trash and mechanical. So if somebody's going to build a, a new building down in the Central Business District, as you know, difficult it might be to imagine, but they do, they've got to put in place screening for trash and mechanical. There's also strictures in there about awning clearance and, and depth, uh, building materials, roof design and materials. So great stuff. If somebody's going to come and build something else in the Central Business District that is already in place and has been in place for about 20 years. Uh, and then also there's a, a language in there about uh, a, a building and grounds. So the signage, it talks about sidewalk signs and abandoned signs. And there's page after page after page about signage in there. So we've got that in place. There's a verbiage in there about sidewalk clearance, outdoor storage being prohibited and we're going to talk about this more in just a moment. There's also language in there about indoor storage. You may recall uh, about three years ago, we brought forward uh, some language about limiting the inside storage to about 50% and that the inside storage cannot be visible from the street. Um, so that's in there. And then of course, it, there's language in there about no fencing, uh, no chain link in the front of, the, of those buildings. So. Uh, what does this uh, ordinance do for you? What does it actually add that's not already there? Uh, it uh, says that uh, within 180 days, and I look at this, I just want to kind of talk about that for a second. We put this in 180 days, so okay, we're going to ask you to approve this ordinance, and then we're going to say, dear business owners, <coughs> look, or dear building owners, 180 days from now, these strictures are going to go into a, a, a enforcement mode. So you've got all that time to think about, okay, what do you have to do to bring your building up to code before you, you start facing any penalties? So uh, again, we go back down. So uh, the graffiti removed in 14 days, awnings repaired and clean. That's sort of significant. We've got some issues downtown right now. Leaking roofs repaired. This is really important because we've got some buildings there that are, the, the, the uh, roofs are actually about to collapse in and every time we, we, somebody buys one of those things, it's always a big issue. Gosh, how much is it going to cost to repair that building? And think about what happens if that building were to fall in because the building did collapse, the roof did collapse. Then you've got all those issues with the adjoining properties. So that's a pretty important one to put in there. Uh, it talks about walls that need to be painted and repaired. This is one that the, the cargo trailer is restored and no new. What that's talking about is the language in there says that you can't have any more new cargo trailers in the central business district. But if you have a cargo trailer presently, then it needs to be brought up to pristine condition. In other words, it needs to be painted. It needs to look nice. One that comes to mind, I know there's, there's an old Carolina freight trailer uh, down uh, behind uh, in the North Alley. It would look great if it was painted you know, pristine and you had Carolina Freight, it would be, in my mind, a bit of a museum piece and a bit of a memorial, but it's got to be taken care of. And again, no new trailers, no new cargo trailers allowed. Uh, broken glass has to be repaired immediately and signs can't be in disrepair. We do have a lot of language uh, in the zoning ordinance, but there's nothing in there that really 
digs that signage being in good repair. And that's important. There are some places in Central Little Sisters right now where there's some signs that are, are in disrepair. Um, so what about design issues? Again, outside storage prohibited per the zoning boards. We already talked about that. And inside storage limited to the less, less than 50%. What's that? The uh, reason I put that on there is because once uh, council uh, codifies this, I think it's now is the time to then tell the building owners, hey, per the zoning <coughs> ordinance and also per this recodified uh, ordinance here, you can't do that anymore. So there's two or three places in the central business district that I think of off the top of my head where that would uh, cause the owner to have to clean up some stuff outside and also a couple inside. And this last one here, or excuse me, uh, next to the last of the flowers have to be alive. Uh, love the fact that we've got flower urns all over town. Love that. But uh, kind of lose something if those flowers in there are all you know, dead and hanging over. And then what we're asking is folks, hey, don't let that happen. It's okay to have a bare flower pot. It's just not okay to have a flower pot with all that trash in there. Um, and then window displays in place, this is uh, significant. One of the ways that communities prevent blight is even if the building is vacant, you've got some sort of a seasonal display in there. And I think about how the uh, the old Mabry buildings uh, used to be. They put a, a Christmas display in there. And it looked great. If if you didn't know that building was was vacant at the time, you walk by. Hey, that's a, that's a really cool looking Christmas display. So what the language in that ordinance requires is that you've got some sort of a display in there. It can be photos or whatever. Um, you know, piece of art, something that makes it look like, hey, this is not just a dead storefront and then this one about the signs being professionally lettered i like to, to hearken to the days before the cherry pit was uh down on the corner there and uh, the owners were in there and said okay guns and guitars which was just lettered with a with a paintbrush um, so that's not professional lettering we're talking about if you're going to have signage it's got to be professionally lettered no matter what uh, form that it takes um, okay, so now we get to a, a part that we had to do some real thinking about, and this is talking of, about boarding standards. And this is a little tricky because if you, I promise you, if you go to 10 different municipalities, you're going to get 10 different answers. What's, what's the, the right way to go? So we thought about this a bit, and this is what uh, we landed on. So first thing we did was, okay, let's, let's differentiate uh, the type of boarding. We're talking about short-term emergency, in other words, a window has just been broken out or doors has been broken in. What do you do then? What's the requirement? The other one is, okay, uh, what if a building is under construction? What's the requirement then as far as boarding? And or what about the issue of long-term boarding? In other words, the window has been boarded up for years. What are we gonna do? So <coughs> the is up into those three. So, okay, short-term uh, emergency boarding, do it for 60 days. What's the cost of the permit? The first permit is free and you can uh, renew it once and it would be $100 for the second time. Hopefully you're gonna have taken care of it by then. And what is it the status required within 24 hours of a broken front facing door or window? Let me just say that again. Required if it's a front facing door or window. In other words, it's on the street side and you're coming through and somebody's just broken out a, a picture window of one of the businesses, okay. But what if it's a back alley window? Well, right now, we'll say, okay, if you want to do the long-term boarding on that, you can, up to a point, because that we're gonna talk about at the moment, we're gonna put a structure in place that says, hey, at some point, nobody can have long-term boarding in the central business district. But in the interim, if your building has a broken window and it's on the back alley, yeah, you can put a, the boarding up there for now. Okay, the other one is construction. This permit would be for 180 days. The first one is free, can be renewed once, and the second one would be $100. And this is, again, per building. We're not talking about per window. We're talking about you've got this whole building under construction. You have a fee there of $100 if you're doing it the second time around, and it's during active construction. 
Okay, so long term, again, uh, prohibited after 7127. And you see, those are different. That's because we're given that 180 day lag there. When you say, okay, this is it, city council has just codified it, you've got that 100, 180 day lag between when you got to get it done. Okay, so that's boarding again. This was a little, little, little tricky, and hopefully uh, this passes muster with uh, not only with yourselves but also with uh, citizens. Uh, so let's talk just uh, for a minute about uh, some standards that have to be enforced if, if it's reuse or renovation. All right, so if somebody has come and bought that building, and it's they're going to come and they're going to refurbish it. God bless them, love it. But what are the what are the standards? Uh, so. This is one that's interesting, uh, you know, no barred windows. There's at least a couple of buildings that are currently vacant downtown that have barred windows, and they're there for a good reason. So the way the language actually reads is it can't be barred unless it's required by law. So if you're selling a weapon in there, you probably need to have a barred window. But if you're selling, you know, clothes in there, you probably don't need to have a barred window. So unless it's required, uh, no barred window and no new opaque glass. Uh, a lot of cities make a big deal about this. They want you to be able to kind of see into the buildings and not you know, come down the street and everything is closed up and you can't look in. But we've got a couple of buildings downtown that have opaque glass. But rather than saying, okay, you've got to change all that glass out, what we're saying here is no new opaque glass. So if you've got it there now, when you all codify this thing, hopefully in February, so if it's existing then, okay, great. But no one after February can come and put opaque glass in the building. And the awnings, uh, again, I mentioned that there's a lot of language in already in the zoning coordinates about awning, you know, setbacks and uh, off the uh, off the street and that kind of thing. But what we're putting here is that the fabric awnings are preferred, uh, not absolutely required, but preferred. And but plastic is prohibited, and you can't put awnings across multiple businesses. Now you know downtown uh, at, at one point, as you're all well all well aware, um, we had awning that was you know in multiple buildings. Most of that stuff is already gone, so we're saying we don't want that to, to be the case anymore. We want to say, okay, if you have individual businesses, then they've got their own separate awning, and it has a much more pleasing look. So that's, that's almost a non-issue uh, at this point. Uh, materials and design are, uh, uh, mimic what's in the zoning ordinance, and that's just type, it talks about type of brick and uh, coloring and all sorts of issues. And the paint color and schemes have to be approved by the Architectural Review Board. If somebody wants to uh, renovate a building and, and put uh, some kind of a wild paint scheme up, they can't do that because the ARB has to approve what the paint scheme is and you i'm sure you're probably all aware that we've had uh, uncg has worked with us for years about recommended paint schemes downtown we got some of that going and you see how pleasing it is uh, how all those new paint schemes are mixing together on main street you want to continue that and not allow any wild thing out there and lastly uh, there's requirement for uh, pristine brick surfaces uh, to remain pristine. In other words, if you've got a painted surface and you come in, that you're in this building that you've just bought and you want to paint it again, great. But if it's pristine and it hasn't been painted, you're not allowed to start painting brick that is pristine and <coughs> unpainted. But you still need to you know, clean it up and point it up and that kind of thing. So I put this in here and this is actually in the in the ordinance, it talks about historic tax credits. People talk a lot about it. I'm not going to go through these. This is just, okay, what you have to do in order to get an historic tax credit. And they're easy to say, easy to talk about, and not so easy to get because there's a lot of strictures that you have to put in place. And uh, Dave does a great job of talking to pr prospective owners about what this actually looks like. I just wanted to put that actually in our ordinance so that so there it sits, just in case someone is reading, hey gosh, what is this historic tax credit business about? Again, uh, easy, easy to talk about, but, but hard to do. 
Okay, so this gets down to now the, the teeth here. So what would compel somebody to actually comply with what's in this ordinance uh, that, that's really getting ready to codify in February? Well, what we did was, okay, let's put the enforcement uh, where it is always then with the zoning administrator, but again, with the help of the downtown director who has to say, hey, there's an issue here, we need to address this. And so here you go. Uh, notifications are always in writing. There's escalating monetary penalties. And, uh, okay, they're pretty easy until you get down to this third citation and issue for three days and it escalates daily. Then, then there's, real, there's some real teeth in there if you started escalating $50 a day is increasing. By the end of the week, that's 350 uh, bucks. And the end of the month, it's you know, in the thousands. Uh, potential civil penalties are in there. I would leave that to the attorneys. And the appeals would be through the city council and excuse me, the city manager and then to the city council if necessary. So that's the, that's what that ordinance is. And again, I would ask you to uh, probably read it if you haven't already. When we come back in February, when we get the public meeting and the vote, that, they, that you've had a chance to really dig into it. But again, we've got some time between now and then for other ideas. Um, actually, let me, let me uh, this is also in there, uh, lest I forget, um, there's one little structure in there about requirements for approval of exterior renovation work in the central business district. This is just that somebody is, since this is our historic district, somebody is watching it very closely to be sure that it remains uh, the uh, aesthetically pleasing place that it is. So the ARV, has responsibility to issue a certificate of appropriateness. And that's just saying, yeah, that that uh, addition there would be great to have downtown. That looks like it would you know, fit in well. So they issue a certificate of appropriateness. The uh, city of Cherville issues the zoning permit. Gaston County issues the building permit. And then, of course, you have to comply with all local county and state codes. So the only real thing in there is a certificate of appropriateness that uh, needs to be in place from the Architectural Review Board. And again, the members of whom are approved by the City Council. So there's that, that ordinance there. Um, and th this was probably the most difficult one to get through. This next one uh, is talking about vacant buildings in the Central Business District. This one I'll be able to get through pretty quickly for you. Um, so again, to, to back up, to restate, You've got that first ordinance that talks about, hey, if you have a building in a central business district, you've got to maintain it in a manner that's appropriate so that it looks nice and that it maintains the property value for everybody else, okay? But this one here is talking about, okay, if that building that you own happens to be vacant and you don't have an active business in there, then there are some certain requirements that you have to meet in order to uh, be sure that uh, you're not uh, hurting the values of the other businesses. So here we go. Uh, same thing, uh, agenda, I will not uh, uh, bore you with it. The purpose is very much the same as the other ordinances, is to maintain the historic character, the property values, and the appeal, and it's to prevent blight or vacancy. So these obviously go hand in hand in tandem with one another. Uh, same applicability, responsibilities, similar, zoning administrator enforcement upon request, and the downtown director handles the administration and maintains the vacant building registry. And again, downtown director has got to, got to be the one that's doing a lot of heavy lifting, uh, watching what's going on downtown before he gets the zoning administrator involved. Okay, so. What in the world is a, a vacant building? And again, I bet if you looked at 10 different municipalities, you'd get 10 different definitions uh, of what a vacant building is. But just for simplicity, we've, we've settled upon a, a building that's primarily used for warehousing, not an active business in there, somebody's just storing stuff. Uh, it doesn't have any regular business hours, or don't have, okay, you know, eight to five, you can come here and buy something. Nope, uh, it doesn't have that and not open to the public. And again, you know, folks get out sorts of different little uh, 
nuances that you can add to that list, but I think that's sufficient. Everyone knows what a vacant building is when you see it, uh, generally. Okay, so uh, what's the, what happens here? The, the uh, registration responsibility of owners. Okay, so if you've got a vacant building in downtown Central Business District, you've got to register that building. That's the first one. You have to complete a registration form, and you need to redo that annually. Every year, same time, if you bought a, bought a building right now, uh, a year from now, in September, you'd have to re-register that building. And uh, you have to pay a registration fee unless it's exempt. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. So there's a little bit of teeth. If you just thought that building sitting here, we're going to start going after you for some money. But if, you, if you're doing the right thing, it's, there's no fee. And facilitate entry for inspection if asked. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if the fire chief or the police chief or somebody else, the city manager needs to come get into the building, you gotta let them in that building. And that's probably, it uh, goes without writing it down, but nonetheless, we put it in the reg. Uh, excuse me, ordinance in my army background is coming up sometimes. Um, so what are we asking the, the owner to do when he registers? Uh, uh, I'm not gonna, uh, bore you by reading that list, but that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, who are you? What's, where's the building? Um, what is it? Uh, and I will say this one, that request for, for, fee, for a fee waiver, again, we're gonna talk about, okay, what allows you to get a fee waiver? We're gonna talk about that. Okay, first let's look at this schedule of uh, registration fees. Again, 10 different cities, you get 10 different fee structures. We're trying to find one that seems reasonable, that, that doesn't pound our neighbors in the nose too hard, but also eventually put some real teeth into this thing. And so we've settled upon, upon this. So initial first year, registration fee is zero. First time you review it a year, it's a hundred bucks. Second time, it goes up to 500 and look about that. Now look, now you've had that building sitting there for quite a while by the time that $500 fee sits. But, and again, there's gonna be some some issues in here about how do you not pay that fee? Lots of stuff you can do to not pay that fee. But if you just got that building sitting there, you don't have to do anything with it. By the time you get around that second one, that's 500 bucks. Third annual is a thousand. And then each year after that, it's 2000. So. Pretty easy at the beginning, get pretty, pretty challenging there at the end. Um, not trying to, to be uh, difficult, but we are trying to put a little bit of teeth into it so folks will actually comply with what they need to do. Okay, so what do you have to do to be exempt from uh, the vacant building registration? Well, if there's been fire damage in the building, or this is really important, the biggest thing for sale or lease actively, what does that mean? That means you've got a realtor and there's advertisement going out and you're showing the building. Okay, that's that's actively for sale. That's good stuff. Um, what, if, what if you have a building that is worth 150 and you're asking 500,000 for it? That's a, that's a good point. And Gary, honestly, uh, there was some language in that that we had originally and I took that out um, because people so that's how can you Call somebody if they want to sell it for five hundred thousand. They should be able to. Um, I just look at the council members in, in the face. Should I should I uh, recover that language that I had in there about that issue? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Because somebody could say, "Hey, I'm trying to sell it, but right. I'm asking a million dollars for it." Right. And right. they're just they're just doing that to <clears throat> avoid the fee. Right. I think I had it that it uh, can't be originally. I had it uh, can't be for more than twenty five percent more than the appraised value. Is it appraised value or tax value? Uh, we can figure out which, which one is appropriate, but that was, that was the, I do recall that was what it was, the 25%. You have to pay for an appraisal. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, that's, I'm, so that's great. I'm, I'm taking, taking that aboard. Uh, next time you see this, we'll have, have that figured out. Okay. Uh, the next one is to be under renovation. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it could be active renovation. Uh, if you've got the engineer drawings, uh, if you've got a plan, 
if you've got a building permit. So you're doing what you're supposed to do. So there are some buildings in downtown that have been bought, that have engineering plans in place, and there's a plan to work those buildings. Um, those would be exempt the way we presently have this written. But if you, on the other hand, if you've got a vacant building that's sitting down there and nobody's done anything with it, and I know a few that it's just been sitting there and you can't seem to get them to move to, to sell it or to fix it or whatever, that's when that kicks in. So that's what we've done to uh, exempt folks. And they can all take that under advisement how we thought we need to do to change the language for that. Okay. Um, so enforcement by the zoning administrator, you're gonna notice that this slide looks a lot like the slide that you just saw from the other ordinance, true enough. Notification in writing, escalating monetary penalties, uh, potential civil penalties and appeals to the city manager and the city council. And again, that whole process has got to be in tandem with the downtown director and the zoning director uh, and uh, work closely and, and bring that to fruition. Okay, so there you go. Those are, those are the, the, the overviews of both of those ordinances. So the next step is, uh, at your next meeting, we'd ask you to set the public meeting date for February 10th. And the reason there's a, such a, a lag is because we're getting into the holiday season and we didn't want to get the, all this stuff jammed up. And there's no reason to get it jammed up. Plus, it will allow us to, to do this. On November 20th, the city manager and I have worked on the idea of having an informal citizens information meeting. And I don't have to put out any invitations yet, but uh, the city manager and I would love to have a uh, Council member or two with us when we do this. We'll probably do it over in the, uh, um, not this building, so. Mm -hmm. This would be the city mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, but anyway, uh, that would be an informal citizen information meeting. It's not the same as the public meeting where they come and you're getting ready to vote. This is just okay. We've sent you the letter that says, here's the ordinances. Come back and talk to us. I'm sure there'll be some pushback. We want to take that under advisement, and uh, and then we'll do the uh, public meeting that you set back in October. We'll have it here. And of course, we'll do all the things of like putting ads in the newspaper and all that kind of stuff. That's that's all. We have. That's all. We have. So, uh, well, I was very patient for 35 minutes of me yakking at somebody. It's, that's hard. Um, Mr. City Manager. Questions? I'm, I'm ready to. I have a couple. Now, I know there's a lot of work that went into this. That's what? We've been through it several times, but it needs to go through it multiple, multiple times. Yeah, Steve right. has looked at multiple cities, ordinances right. that are similar to this. You <coughs> went to the Architectural Review Board. You you know, he's talked to them about, you know, what works, what doesn't work. You know, it's been it's been redone probably at least ten times, I'd say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this is my first time yeah. seeing this. This is my first time seeing it. You done? I have a couple questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And you may have covered this, but is the... Uh, Central Business District, basically the whole district historic. Uh, no, it's not. It, it, the historic, National Historic District is not exactly uh, a footprint. And as, as an example, I, and I couldn't tell you exactly what it is off the top of my head, but I do know, for example, there's a couple of uh, private homes on uh, Main Street that are to the west of downtown that are considered to be in the historic district but are not in the footprint of the central business. Well, that was my next question about uh, residences in the central business district. There are a couple. There are a couple of residences in the central business district. Right? Ms. Ms. Hodges, if you look on page 10 on your uh, iPad, you can see the highlight of what the central business district actually is. There's yeah, also I, some I, commercial I, buildings that aren't in it because they have blue metal on the front of them or 
that one that I think that was my third 90, question. <laughs> that, that was my third question. Nineties bill is in it now, but it's not part of it because it's more of a mid-century modern type building instead of well, a historic. Right. So I, I, I was referring. I know those houses right there are in the historic district, but again, they're not in the temple. Okay, let me see right. where we are there. That's so Mulberry. That, 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 this, Mulberry. Is, this is Maine, and that's Mulberry. There's the there's the bridge right there. So that house right there uh -huh. is in the historic district, but it's not in the central business district. So they're not, it's not an exact overlay. Okay, well, the house on Oak Street, that first house Somebody on the out. west side, <laughs> that first house on Oak Street on the west side, right behind uh, the okay. residential. I mean the business buildings. Academy. Or you go to Academy and Oak. Are you talking about you Tom look, White's house? Yeah. No, I'm not. No, on the other side of the of the, of the road. That's okay, not, on Main Street, Academy. you've got all the buildings there, the businesses. Right. right. That's Main. Main and Oak. Look at Main and Oak. Main. And Oak right. is the. Okay. Right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. that it? Okay. Oak is the one-way street. Yeah, Main and Oak. Uh, that that first white house, it's a it's an older house. Well, are we talking about right behind in the parking lot? <laughs> yes, right, right beside the parking lot. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand that that is the oldest house in Cherryville. I was told that 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 little white house is the oldest house in Cherryville. I don't know if any re if y'all done any research or anybody's done any. It's, it's not. Huh? It's not, it's not a historic house in the registry. Okay, well, I didn't know that, yeah, but Rita Beam, the, Rita Beam is the one that told me yeah, that. When they did that, that house is not <coughs> listed under the historic registry. Even though it's the oldest house in Cherryville, yeah, it's yeah, never it's been. It's never, they, somebody hadn't gone through the paperwork, Seems but that's all right. No, they, when the state did that, it was not, they did I know what Josh is talking about, I don't think it's. The, the next house, I think it's the Henry, was the Henry Summit. I know, that's what I thought. I do too. The second house. The second house. You're going to drive me crazy, I'm about to look. Well, that, that may be right, that may be right. Okay. No, it's not part of this court. Now, the one that Gary mentioned that has the, the blue metal on it, can we not do the can no. we not do something about that? Well, that house is that those buildings have just been purchased probably within the last month. Uh, is that right? Yeah, he's uh, uh, he from uh, Pennsylvania. He bought them in May and he's starting to work on them. They've got a new roof to go on yes. and across the street. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And her sister's got a sister. Yeah. So the one with the blue metal has just recently been bought. Yes. Last and, couple months. and he's uh, already applied for his grants for the roof, HVAC, uh, and we're trying to talk to him about taking the metal off the front. But it is appropriate from the historic district of downtown because of our date. And he likes the blue metal, but well, his contractor doesn't. So he's trying to talk him into taking it off. I will tell you this. I can remember Mr. O'Leary talking about it. If if he would have bought that building and taken the blue metal off, it lost its historical credits. You couldn't, right. qual you couldn't right. qualify. Um, yeah. Well, he could have kept it if he put apartments on which side. Now, if you put apartments, you can take it off. Which is that half window. Yeah, that's 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 other than that, because of the that's day, if you take the blue off and don't put apartments, right, so you can't do the historic right. tax credits. Mm -hmm. But if you put apartments, you can take it off. What a shame. So it's a bit confusing because the, the, the period of uh, historicity or whatever it is uh, was when all that blue metal was on those days. Uh -huh. But in my mind, probably a lot of people in this room, if you think back historically, okay, it goes back way before yeah. blue was really put on there. And the historic district was done uh -huh. according to the state, <laughs> the state and the state. And the blue yeah. stuff was on there. That's the historic date. So that's why Mr. Leary really could apply for the tax credit. Gotcha. Okay. All right. I think I think that's the only question. <laughs> okay. This is kind of funny. 
give everybody a good laugh. On um, the flowers have to be alive. I guess that that eliminates artificial flowers. <laughs> 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 Alive or sealed? <laughs> what's, what's going on with flowers more? David, are you on flower part? I was curious about asking about flowers and more. Do we know what's going on? With that? I spoke to Miss Moore two weeks ago. She wants to sell the building, but she doesn't want to list the building. But she wants to sell it, but she only wants to sell it with everything in the building. Mm all the merchandise and I've shown it four times to different people and there's a couple in Atlanta that are wanting to move up here and are interested in buying everything in it but they've got to sell their stuff in Atlanta before they can buy it so uh, but she does not want to list it with the realtor and she's got a pretty good price on it mm -hmm. okay. does anyone else have any questions Okay, so this is for information only, and you can go back and read this. The course of time will set the public meeting uh, at the October 14th meeting. Steve, thank you for all your work that was put into this. It's been a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're now to item five, other business. What do we have to come up? We have Mr. Strapp that was looking to speak to council, and y'all should have email and the pictures that he's going to talk about. Yeah, so like Brian said, I, I emailed you all a proposal from myself and some of my neighbors. I'm Sid Strapp, and I live at 207 West Academy Street. But before I got into that, I just wanted to let you all know, um, I want to say a few words of thanks to the city because the pickups on the streets this summer, the leaves and everything, keeping the streets, it just looked really great. So, Brian, please pass that along. And there's one guy that's in particular, Tommy Calhoun. I just actually got his name day before yesterday. He's been working for the city cleaning up, you know, where the Carlton Mill building used to be. And what he's doing is, is he's mowing about two or three strips into the lot from the street and it just greatly improves the look of that vacant lot. You know, that's where a lot of our folks are coming in from 279 and then they stop there at that stop sign. And before he was doing this extra work, you know, you had all this stuff growing out in the street there around the particular where the railroad tracks are. It just looks super. So I told him, I said, I want to mention your name at the next time I talk to the council. So y'all please tell him thank you for he that. He does a great job. He does all Main Street. He is just super. He's edging the Very curbs, good. which to me is a big thing, edging the grass off the curbs. Is and he then, doing that um, for the property owner at the Carlton Mill, or is that just throw right our sidewalk, just to look at it. Along our sidewalk there. Yeah, and it just looks, and it, it almost makes it look welcoming to walk that street when you don't have those weeds and stuff, you know, on that side. And then the last thing was I wanted to thank whoever it was that went ahead and painted the uh, traffic uh, signal poles along Main Street because, you know, they look pretty rough, y'all. Yeah. Not but, a lot of them. <clears throat> well, and they look super, you know, they're now black, matte, look just super. Okay. So with all that said, um, what, what my proposal is, it's me and a bunch of neighbors there on, in that area along Academy Street. And we, we wanted to come to you all with sort of a, a joint a plan or proposal where we would pick up some cost and hopefully you all could pick up some cost to improve the street front there across from the First Presbyterian Church on the West Academy Street. It's there, that strip that's right next to the old Rescue Squad building. Right now, there are three or four old willow trees that are dying on their way to death. And they're really scraggly at the top. That's when you know that, that they're on their way out. And also those uh, roots and everything have grown up in that bed, um, which prevents the few people that do at the church, at least, that wanna park over there in that little lot. You know, you can't walk through there because you're scared you're going to drop in a hole, a pothole, or hit one of those roots. So 
that was really the impetus for this was to, uh, first of all, just for our street, you know, the people that live on it to try to improve the look. So I broke it up into four phases in the, my email. The first one, I, what I said was, uh, we, the neighbors, we're going to come up with some money to remove, if you will, allow us to do this, to remove those three dying oak trees that are sitting in that bed. Um, and wow, we've got a storm going on. <laughs> but um, also, as we remove them, we're going to have the roots dug out, you know, so we can smooth the bed out for the future planting. And what we'd like to do in that bed is, once again, in, in November, December, we've got 50 more cherry trees coming into town to plant. And we'd like to put three or four of those in that bed. And further down the road, if we can raise some money ourselves, we'd like to maybe put a few azaleas in there to make it look like a real nice looking bed. Um, so phase one was to remove you know, those oaks and to allow us to grind up the roots. We've got a quote for it. It's a very reasonable quote, and we're going to pay for that. The, in this phase two, that's the November, December, we would plant three or four of the, uh, the uh, Kwanzaa cherry trees in that bed. And, you know, we'll be allowing for future planting. Maybe we'll have some flowers and bulbs in there for the spring. Number three, the parking lot itself. It's okay. I mean, it needs to be swept. Um, there's a lot of loose gravel in it and stuff. And if, if we could get that cleaned up by the city and then perhaps restrike the parking spots on there, that would really help the visual on it. Um, now that's just on the east side of that, what is it, the uh, emergency power system, that big General thing. That, <laughs> so it's just on the one side. So it'll give the church in particular, because that's right in front of the sanctuary. It'll give the church about 10 or 12 more spots for people that are handicapped to be able to be parked very close to the front door of the church. Uh, phase four, this is really what I'm asking for you all to consider, and that would be uh, to take a look at this rescue squad building. I noticed that in the new central business district, um, you know, regulations, it talks about leaving uh, what is it, faded on and rotten awnings up on buildings where you've got your own building that have got that there. And I'd like just to request that at the least, maybe we could get you all to take those down, just remove them from the building and take those, um, the uh, shutters. Some of the shutters have been broken and they're not on the building. So just take them all down and put the building back the way it was when it was originally built back in the 60s. Um, and then lastly, I think, you know, if, if money allows, it would be great if we could get you all to paint that rescue squad building like you did the police station over here. I have to commend whoever came up with that design. Uh, it looks really sharp. It's modern. It goes with sort of the, the mid-century modern, you know, sort of basic building, brick buildings that public uh, spaces would put together. So. That's really the four plan uh, phases. Um, but I'm just making the appeal that I'm sure that you all agree that it's, it's sort of an eyesore, that plot and then the trees and then all the growth and things. So I guess I'm looking for approval. Could we move ahead and at least have the trees cut down and set up the bed? At this point, um, we would go ahead and plant the cherry trees in the bed and then if you all needed time to look for budget monies to do the painting, I understand. Um, but I would like to maybe get the awnings down off the building and those shutters to just improve the look on the inside. Let, let me say this. Uh, obviously, phase one and two, I'm 100% in favor of. Uh, phase three, the parking lot. Actually, I, I think I talked to Gary about it this weekend. Uh, the the grant that we have through HUD, the $810,000 grant to remodel City Hall, part of those funds are designated to where we're going to try to pave that whole park. Oh, that'd be so, great. Uh, I did finally get access to the DRGR system on Friday, 
Today I got the action plan submitted into the system, so I have to get ac get Dixie access now because there has to be two representatives from the city to be on there. So hopefully we are getting very close to being able to put this project out for bid and try to get this get this going. Uh, so that would solve phase three is we repaved the whole parking lot because if you go out there towards Mulberry Street, I'm sure you've all hit the pothole there. That, you know, we filled in with coal patch a hundred times. But, you know, it's just, it's, yeah. it's got to be we've repaid. appreciated it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, hopefully that will take care of itself yeah. soon. And then phase four, I have no problem with going ahead and trying to get the awnings down, get the, uh, the shutters taken off, and then hopefully we can figure out a way to possibly paint the building next few months. That would make it look a lot better. That parking lot. Because people use that parking lot yeah. when there's downtown festivals. Yeah. And uh, so we use that building for the Christmas decorations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. store uh, our Christmas decorations. Oh, really? Yeah. That's brick. Yeah. 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 It would have to have been before to be pristine. Pristine. Yeah, that was the key. Yeah, it's it's that it's 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 pristine. Pristine. Is that the well, same started. brick that City Hall is built with? Probably. Yeah, I think it's the same brick. It was, it was the same brick as the community center. You remember they built all these somewhere in the 60s, 70s. Get time frame. Get rid of them nasty trees. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I make a motion we go ahead and approve allowing the church to uh, do what they've detailed here in both his phase one and two of his proposal. I second it. All in favor? But I just want to you know, make sure y'all understand it's not, I'm not representing the church, you know, although I'm a member there, it's really, I'm also a street, a resident on the street. So it's really more the neighbors that we really wanted to try to just make that improvement for us as well as the church. You know, I don't want to. Well, we, we appreciate you trying to yeah. improve that and raise funds to do it. Well, we're doing the best I'm thing. 26 years I've been in that building, I wanted those trees gone. <laughs> <laughs> The leaves was always oh yeah, the leaves are quite a, noose, a nuisance. But this yeah. is going to really help the appearance, especially with a lot of the business and the manufacturing and people that come up and down that road. Too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you, everything y'all do. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Favor, I think that's a good thing. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Sid. You know, if you're going to do something, we have to practice what we preach. So. That's all right. Get this one. Anyone else have anything? I have a quick thing. I had a call from a a young gentleman who is in love with nature. And he also is an environmentalist. He wants to protect the environment very much. And he had some questions about our recycling center. And I went out there today and I hadn't been out there lately, but I went to the recycling center and Ronnie Hovis and I, we were, we were strict recyclers. We recycled everything. And I know things have changed over the years, but this gentleman that called me, he said, I understand that only corrugated cardboard can be recycled. Now we say mixed paper in that one, but he says he's understanding that all paper can't be recycled anymore. Now, I'm just throwing out these questions. It's only the corrugated cardboard. Does it? I have no idea. Uh, well, who picks up that container? The, the county Santa. picks up. Oh, go ahead. Santa. What is it, Santa Rosa or something? They pick up, they used to pay us for recycling, but it's not enough now. That we just pay them to take it is off. it is it a local contractor? No, um, Santa Grove or I can't remember the exact name. The point he was making to me, in addition to the other container, which is what everything else, plastics and all except the 
the cans that the fire department, he, uh, he religiously puts the cans there for the fire department, but the other one that is used for everything else except the televisions that's in that trailer. If what the point he's trying to make is, he said people need to be told the truth that if it's not going to be recycled, they don't need to waste their time. Just put it in the regular garbage. This, if that makes any sense, I'm just sharing this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Jeff Cash told us one time that it was all being hauled off to the dump now. Well, the only reason it, it is not being recycled. People feel good. None of that stuff's being recycled. <laughs> well, he just said he just said you know if it, it, it's great if it's being recycled, but if not, just let the people know about it. Put it in the regular garbage. <laughs> I, mean, I think most people yeah, use yeah. that. I think most I people think use that is. as when you know Christmas time comes or you have a lot you know a big purchase and you have large boxes that you can't fit fit mm -hmm. in your regular trash can. There. That's the only time I go. That's the only time I go. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, yeah. that's well, we take our plastic, <laughs> you know, we separate them. Waste management does pick it up. Waste management picks it up. Waste management mm -hmm. picks, but, but we don't know what they do with it. Uh, but anyway. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of communities that have had the curbside recycling. Mm -hmm. It's a financial loser. I Do know. Ever try to do it because you will lose money. Completely. I agree with that. Do not ever try. I definitely agree with that. So uh, it becomes a mess. People get to think. And he, I don't know how he knows this, but if, 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 unless somebody's told him, he says that people out in the county bring their garbage there, and that's not fair for us that pay city taxes. <laughs> But I don't know so well, much. Is that costing us anything? Though? Are we paying? Mm -hmm. we're paying. We're That's part of their route when they pick up. Okay, so I'll just uh, I'll let him know that I brought this to your attention, and so as of right now, we're just going to leave things like they my, are. My biggest complaint about that the cardboard box container is if you if you go up there. You know, it, it's a mm -hmm. it's an opening about like this. Mm -hmm. Well, ninety percent of the time, you can't get the box into opening. So what people do, they just throw it on the ground. Mm -hmm. and our guys have to go and try to figure out how to get it into the box. I know. I agree. I know. I wish we had a sliding door that was a little bigger so that you could get stuff in. Okay. Anyone else? I've got one thing. Okay. He said. Dixie just said it goes to the recycling center in Charlotte. That's where waste management takes it. Yeah, okay. That's good. That's what I'll tell him. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Okay. Uh, one thing that I have is I was approached, I was running a few errands and I was on Main Street and I got several store owners said some things about concerned about the parking. And I think, David, you've had to maybe deal with that before with the merchants. Some of them complaining or pointing out that three vehicles point there to be his business, or those vehicles belong to the people in there working, or just all the way down the street. And so, you know, there's nowhere for merchants to park to come up there, go in their street, shop, and go out and leave. And these vehicles are staying up there five and six hours sitting there on the street. We got so, people that live upstairs in some of those apartments too. That park yes. The yeah, are they still doing it? They thought they I had stopped so. that. Some of them didn't. You know, that some of that had been stopped. The apartments doing. aren't as much as the no. merchants. The merchants. And one of the merchants doesn't have a rear door entrance to his facility. And he has to walk, if he parks in the back, has to walk all the way around all the buildings to get in the front door. That's me too, because I don't have yeah. a key to the back door. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that one, I, you know, we've, been, we've spoken to them and we, I put in, you know, talk to the merchants about not doing that. Okay. Um, and sometimes on Monday when none of them are up there, there's a couple merchants that do park on Main Street because most of the merchants are closed. So I don't say nothing to them about that. Right. Right. I'll just let them know that it, you have mentioned to them. Like before I go in my building to open up, I... I go in home folks and eat first, so. So you're a shopper. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Anyone but at else? least you park in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. A lot of them don't do that. I know. I know. Okay, does anyone else have anything to bring forward? Uh, I will say the gym it continues to make progress. They're pretty much finishing up the good. wiring now. Sheet rocks up. They're mudding it. Uh, got the power in. Probably be ready to uh, get the power on in the next, probably sometime next week. So, when do you anticipate a ribbon cut? I'd say a month and a half. Because yeah. yeah. they'll have to get that. They got to, they got to, they're finishing up the air conditioning units and heating units, getting them on, and they'll have to turn them on, let the building get acclimated, and then they'll be able to put the hardwood floors down. It's amazing to think in the last year or so we've got here. Yes, I'm saying. The water park done. The gym's almost complete. The cherry pit's open. Yeah. I mean, there's so much has happened. There's a lot of progress. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll have to say, Richard gets calls every day with people wanting to do more. So there's probably more going. Uh, and if you remember, I told you uh, the other week, uh, Rickway Road did get their first six permits to start uh, building sometime. I got those permits to Richard the other week. Chris took me through it the other week. I had to go down there and look at something at, uh, at the cemetery. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a beautiful development. You know, all the carbon that's going in, it's going to look really nice. It'll yeah, be a beautiful it's, development. It's a pretty area. The mm -hmm. land's really nice. Yeah, it is. Okay, anyone else have anything? Nothing right? We had, I think it's safe. Motion to, to adjourn. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll say that. All the favor. Uh. Uh.